and information from crystal structures with the lower resolution information from uh, electron microscopy structures is known as a hybrid approach. And we use this uh, method to determine a pseudo-atomic structure of the anaphase promoting protein complex, or APC, which is a light multi-protein uh, complex. So I'll say a little bit about the APC first, then describe our methodology for determining the pseudo-atomic structure of the APC. And the APC is a large multi subunit complex which functions as an E3 ubiquitin ligase to regulate progression through the cell cycle by mediating the degradation of cell cycle proteins via the ubiquitin proteasome system. And the APC regulates progression through a cell cycle by controlling the degradation of proteins whose activities inhibit progression through specific cell cycle phases. And these proteins include uh, cyclins, um, mitotic kinases, and the activity of the APC in, at metaphase, where it degrades cyclin and tocurin, uh, triggers chromatid segregation and the onset of anaphase in mitosis. And the APC recognizes most of its substrates through these conserved destruction motifs, which are located within substrates. And these destruction motifs are recognized by the coactivated subunits, CC20 or CDH1, which bind to the core APC during mitosis and during uh, cytokinesis and G1, and these activates the APC to recognize and to uh, ubiquitinate its uh, protein targets. So reflecting the complex functions of the APC, the APC has a complex organization and large size. And the APC from yeast is assembled from 14 distinct proteins, including the coactivator. And these proteins range in size from APC1, which is the largest subunit of about 200,000 Daltons, uh, through to the smallest subunit, CDC26, which is only 9 uh, kilodaltons. And we know from native mass spectrometry and also from crystallography that most, many subunits are present as two copies per complex. So that means that the overall mass of the APC is about 1 to 1.2 megadaltons, depending upon the species. And it's important to actually to determine the stoichiometry of subunits within a complex in order to dock atomic models into the EM-derived uh, structures. And one of the striking features of the APC is that only four subunits are involved in catalysis and substrate recognition. And most of the subunits, about 80% of the APC mass, is involved in scaffolding to organize the overall uh, structure of these uh, catalytic and substrate recognition subunits. And many of these uh, scaffolding subunits are structure-related, and there are three of these so-called uh, TPR subunits, uh, CDC16, 23, and 27, which are based upon this very simple uh, architecture of multiple contiguous copies of a 34 amino acid repeat called the TPR repeat, or tetratoicopeptide repeat. And there are three of these subunits, and the fourth one, which actually has a, an atypical TPR uh, motif. And then these smaller subunits are so-called TPR accessory subunits, and these uh, function to stabilize the structure of the TPR subunits and also to mediate inter-TPR interactions. And these smaller subunits have no defined structure. They're disordered in solution in isolation, but we assume they as assume some structure when bound to the TPR subunits. Now, um, in order to um, determine a pseudo-atomic structure and using the hybrid approach, we have um, determined structures of individual um, APC subunits using a combination of crystallography and homology modeling. And we now have, have structures for most of the large APC uh, subunits through uh, crystallography and homology modeling. And we lack uh, structures only for APC4 and for the end terminus of APC1. And also we lack structures for these smaller um, uh, um, disordered uh, subunits. And this uh, movie shows an example of one of the TPR uh, chemical TPR subunits associated with this accessory subunit, uh, CDC26, so it's CD16 in the TPR subunit. And these TPR subunits homodimerize um, through self association to form this sort of V shaped uh, homodimeric structure. And each, t each TPR subunit um, consists of 14 TPR motifs, and these assemble into uh, 28 anti parallel uh, alpha helices. And then these um, 28 alpha helices actually form this sort of TPR superhelix, which actually consists of two complete turns of a TPR superhelix. And the CC26 molecule actually binds uh, within the inner groove of the TPR superhelix. And then this is then a gallery of other APC subunit structures. And um, similar to CDC16, the other TPR subunits, CDC23 and 27, also are homodimers with this sort of V-shaped structure. And we also determine structures of APC10 and also the co-activated subunits, CTC20 and CTH1. 
And then for other subunits which we have not yet crystallized, we can derive some homology models. So this um, APC is a, a ring domain, ring subunit E3, ubiquitin ligase. And the calyx center of the APC is formed from the ring subunit APC11, which is tightly associated with the collin subunit APC2 by interactions in the C terminal domain of APC2. And we can, this is homologous to the um, SDF E3 ubiquitin ligase determined by Nikola Paltovich. So we can model the structure of APC2, APC11 based upon Nikola Paltovich's SD SDF structure. And then the, the PC domains of APC1, which is the largest subunit, um, are homologous to a PC domain within RPN2, and RPN2 is one of the proteasome subunits. And we determined the structure of RPN2 um, with Ed Morris um, last year, and we therefore can model the structure of APC1 PC domain based upon the RPN2 uh, structure. And inter interestingly, many of the APC subunits are composed of these multiple repeat motifs, so including the TPR motifs, there's also these PC repeats within the uh, PC domain of APC1, which actually forms this toroidal structure, and then the, the correct radius are W40 repeats, which form these beta propeller structures. And then we used um, single particle lithium microscopy to determine the structure of the whole APC, and this um, slide shows a cryo electron micrograph of recombinant uh, S. Pombi APC um, in a cryo electron micrograph, and this shows single particles of the APC embedded in vitreous ice. This shows the two dimensional projections of single APC particles. So by collecting sufficient numbers of uh, these projections, we can uh, reconstruct a three-dimensional volume of the APC. And this shows um, two views of the, actually, the S. Cibrissier APC from endogenous uh, sources. And it shows um, the APC forms this triangular structure measuring about 250 angstroms in longest dimension. And the structure has this very open lattice-like architecture with very well-defined uh, rod-like rod features and also curved tubular features. And these correspond to the, some of these correspond to the TPR superhelices. So the question is, how do we interpret this um, EM structure? And, and how do we generate a pseudo-atomic structure? And how do we, how do we locate this, the atomic models of APC subjects within this EM-derived electron density map? And we used three approaches to, to locate APC subjects into the EM-derived electron density map. And the first approach we used was to um, generate uh, subcomplexes of of the APC, which lack defined subunits. And then by comparing the structures of these uh, subcomplexes, also determined by electron microscopy, the whole uh, complex, the different densities uh, can be assigned to the missing subunits. And this is a way to, to define uh, regions of the electron density uh, to specific subunits. So this, this process required that we could actually reproduce or uh, express the whole APC in a heterologous system. And we used the multi back uh, system for expression of the APC in the insect cell uh, baculobriar system, and this is a multi system developed by Ima Berger. And we cloned all 13 of the uh, SCVCA APC subjects into, uh, into three vectors, actually, and then generated two viruses for co-infection in insect cells, and this then allows us to reconstitute the whole of APC in insect cells. And this works actually quite well, so we can generate about two to three milligrams of APC per 5 litres, which is about a 500-fold increase in yield compared to the yields of APC from endogenous uh, sources of the complex. And then this slide shows a silver stain gel of the uh, native APC compared to the recombinant APC, and there's a direct correspondence of APC bands between the native and the endogenous, I'm sorry, native and recombinant APC. And then we can then use, so this, this uh, recombinant APC is, is active as an E3 ubiquitin ligase. We can show that it will ubiquinate cyclins in the presence of the coactivator, uh, depending upon the uh, destruction motifs, box and debox motifs in, in cycling. So it's active and it recapitulates the activity of the native APC. And then this shows you some structures of the um, recombinant APC determined by negative stain electron microscopy and then various subcomplexes which have been determined. And this subcomplex here called TPR6 is composed of the three canonical TPR subunits, CDC 16, 23, and 27, where there are accessory subunits also um, present. And then this subunit, SC8, are the remaining subunits, which include the mechanic subunits and the subject recognition subunits, in addition to CDC23, which is one of the TPR subunits, which is required to assemble this SC8 complex. This complex won't assemble uh, without um, SC8. And then we can compare these subcomplexes to the whole complex, so we, sh we can then uh, show that these uh, subcomplexes match their corresponding densities on the whole complex. And this shows that these subcomplexes have a stable structure which is autonomous and, and stable and, and, and similar to the structure uh, as it's present within the holo uh, complex. <coughs> so 
So the first approach to, to dock um, APC models into the APC um, map was the so-called um, difference approach. And this approach um, involves comparing two uh, pair of subcomplexes which differ by one subunit. And the different density between these two subcomplexes can then be assigned to the missing subunit. And this is illustrated for CDC-16, the TPR subunit, where we compare two subcomplexes. And only one subcomplex, sorry, only one subcomplex um, incorporates CDC-16. So the different density between these two subcomplexes indicates the position uh, and also the structure of CDC-16. That's shown in this mesh um, electron density. So this, this approach actually both locates the position of the subunit, but also indicates the structure of the subunit, um, which may not have been known previously, but we knew this previously from our X-ray crystallographic <laughs> data of CD16. But this shows that the different density for CD16 matches exactly the structure of the um, molecule determined by crystallography. And this different density shows this sort of shallow uh, V-shaped structure with two-fold symmetry, which exactly matches the, the two-fold symmetry of the CD16 homodimer. And then we can apply a similar approach to CDC27, which um, was determined um, by comparing the holo APC complex relative to a complex lacking uh, CDC27. And the difference density here is located at the top of the TPR lobe, and it shows again a sort of V-shaped uh, symmetrical density uh, structure, which also matches the atomic model of the CDC27. So we apply this approach actually for uh, five APC subunits. But this approach is limited to the ability, or it depends upon the ability um, to generate subcomplexes of the APC um, following the deletion of a particular subunit. And some subunits um, are required for scaffolding functions to help assemble the entire complex, and therefore their deletion will lead to uh, either very small complexes which can't be analyzed by electron microscopy or, or um, uh, destabilized and um, structures lacking a specific conformation. So another approach then is to um, define subunit locations is actually to define by subunit overlap. And in this case, what we did was to um, overlap TPR6 subcomplex with the SC8 uh, subcomplex. And these two subcomplexes share in common CDC23. So the overlap of these two subcomplexes when superimposed onto the holo structure indicates the density for CDC23. And this is shown in this orange color here. And this is the CD23 density, which actually is, shows this, um, uh, again, a twofold structure, which is related by a twofold symmetry axis around CD16 to CD27. This is actually consistent with uh, CD23 and CD27 being parallel, so having similar overall three dimensional structures. So that, that's um, the first approach we apply to, to docking um, atomic models of APC subjects into the APC EM structure. And the second approach we used was to, um, to dock models by direct docking into EM maps by visual inspection. And this is possible when regions of the EM map show strong features characteristic of the, the, um, the um, atomic models of the, of, this, of the structures. And so we apply this approach to APC2, which is this um, Cullin um, subunit. And this approach is actually also facilitated when the majority of the map is assigned by the deletion approach, but that means there's only a limited amount of um, volume to search for this um, other subunits. And also the approach can also be um, guided by other data such as antibody labeling data and also by protein protein interaction information. So in the case of APC2, we knew APC2 was part of the SC8 uh, subcomplex, so we could define the SC8 subcomplex within the um, entire APC volume. And also, we could also uh, map the other uh, subunits determined by the subject, subunit deletion approach. And we also knew that APC2 was located um, adjacent to APC10, which we had always previously uh, docked by the deletion approach. And then this uh, view here shows this very um, um, striking rod-like feature, which matches um, the dimensions of the culinary repeats at the end terminals of APC2. So this allowed us to dock the culinary repeats of APC2 into this rod-like feature and then locate the seed terminal domain of APC2 into this globular feature adjacent to APC10. So that actually also is consistent with the biochemical data of APC10 and APC2 interact. And we also did a similar approach for the PC domain of APC1, which um, has this sort of uh, toroidal circular structure, and this docks very well into a toroidal um, density feature in the, in the, um, base in the, in the um, basement um, uh, platform region of the APC structure. So the third approach we applied to um, 
assign electric density to APC7, it was applied to APC4, and this um, approach was used where we had no existing information about the APC4 structure. So we couldn't uh, map it by visual inspection of the EM density relative to the APC4 structure, and we also couldn't delete APC4 because it's required for assembly of the APC, and we couldn't generate any decent-sized um, subcomplex for analysis by electron mycoscopy. But since we had actually assigned densities for all other large APC subunits, so the remaining density must be due to APC4. So we could extract this density and then assume this uh, corresponds to the APC4 uh, subunit. Now, APC4 was actually only 80,000 Dalton, so it's uh, too small to analyze by um, single particle electron microscopy, even by naked stain single particle electron microscopy. But to aid the analysis of APC4, we um, generated uh, monoclonal antibodies to APC4 and then generated these FAB APC4 complexes. And the FAB APC4 complex now is a large enough size to analyze by single particle electron microscopy. And this shows uh, a, a gallery of 2D class averages of APC4 uh, FAB complexes. And you can see that the, the FAB uh, molecule is actually very well defined. We see this very sort of distinctive um, structure for the FAB, the FV and the FC um, domains. And you can see that the uh, contacting density is less well defined, which indicates APC4 is linked by, uh, well, AP, the FAB binds to a, a flexible epitope on APC4, therefore APC4 is less well defined relative to the FAB um, structure. But some views of, of this uh, complex show quite well defined structural features. And this uh, view here shows this, the structure of APC4 in projection, which matches actually very closely to this uh, view of APC4 electric density extracted from the whole holo APC volume. So that um, confirms this density as being due to APC4. So if we put all these data together, the different approaches for docking um, APC subunits, we can uh, generate this pseudo-atomic model of the APC. And this model is now based upon the uh, recombinant s pombi APC structure, which is uh, still being refined, but it's about um, 8 angstrom resolution at this current stage. So this movie shows you the electron density of the... Oh, it's a bit dark, but this shows the um, electron density of the uh, s pombi uh, APC. And then the pseudo-atomic structure is shown here, and, and this um, structure um, shows that we've docked now 80% of the APC uh, subunits, and we're missing now um, subunits for APC4, uh, the end terms of APC1, uh, and also APC5 is not yet um, fitted into the electron density map, and these are shown in uh, blue, uh, purple, in, and red densities. So um, there's actually a, a, a good fit overall, and we, I should say, we also um, refined the positions of these uh, subunits using Euro, so that provides a good fit of the atomic models into the um, EM density of the APC. And this shows uh, how the, the three clinical TPR subunits, which are all homodimers with a similar structure, stack in parallel along one side of the APC, and they form this um, quasi twofold symmetric structure um, on, this, on this face of the APC. And then the APC2 molecule, which is the, the cadic center of the APC, is shown in this yellow color, and that's um, this long rod-like feature at the end terminus with each other, three cunning repeats of APC2, and then the, the C-terminal domain, which is the globular domain, and the ring uh, subunit, APC11, which is associated to the ring, so the, to the C-terminal domain of APC2, is docked into this globular structure uh, in close proximity to APC10, which is part of the substrate recognition module. So the calyx center of the APC is close to where the APC binds its uh, D-box um, destruction motifs. And then other uh, densities which are not assigned, which are associated to with the TPR subunits, are probably um, represent the, the TPR accessory subunits, which are actually involved in stabilizing the, the TPR and also forming contact between TPR uh, subunits. So, so, so we then we wondered if um, we could use the EM densities um, from this APC structure to solve uh, crystal structures of APC subunits. And it's already mentioned uh, at this meeting the use of EM maps to, uh, to phase structures of crystals by molecular replacement, and we wanted if we could, from an academic exercise, uh, take the uh, density for CDC16 from the APC holo structure and use that as a search model to phase our CDC16 crystals, which had already determined by sad phase. We wanted to, just to, as an exercise, see if we could um, use this density. So we took this uh, CDC16 density, and this is work from Kieran Kukoni in the lab, 
And even though there's actually very little overlap in resolution between uh, crystal structure data and EM data, this process worked actually very well. And, and Kieran placed the EM density for CDC 16 from the uh, APC map into a very large uh, P1 unit cell, five times the dimensions of the, the map, and calculated uh, structure factors to seven angstrom resolution, and then run the phaser in default mode. And, and then he was able to, to determine the position of two copies of this dimer within the asymmetric unit of uh, CDC 16 crystals, and then refined, uh, well, used density modification in DM to um, extend the phaser to five angstrom resolution. And then this shows uh, quite clearly actually that there's um, improvement in the structure, there's, uh, the, the um, phases actually are now improved and it shows clear density for the ab helices within the uh, TPR Matiza CDC 16. So um, we wonder if we can apply now this the same approach to phasing the APC4 crystals. And these crystals we grew um, relatively recently and are, are very small crystals and proving quite hard to, to phase. Uh, we're wondering if we can use this APC4 electric density uh, to phase these APC4 uh, crystals. So, um, so just now I'd like to sort of summarize what I've talked about. So um, to, to generate a pseudotomic uh, structure of a large multi subunit complex, uh, one has to assign the uh, subunits to the respective densities within the um, density map. And then we used uh, three approaches for this. We used this selective subunit deletion approach to define different densities for the uh, subunits. And this has the advantage of actually providing empirical constraints to fitting, so it allows you to determine exactly the position of the, the whole subunit within the EM map, but also the, gives you information about the molecular boundaries of the structure and its overall um, conformation. But the problem with this method is that it relies upon the ability to generate subcomplexes once you've deleted a particular subunit, and that's not always the case for all um, subunits of any large complex. So the second approach is to use simply to um, use visual inspection to identify subunit structures within um, density maps, and this is also possible when you have um, quite high resolution structures with uh, well-defined um, atomic models. And then the third approach is to use uh, naked stain reconstructions of individual subunits. This can be aided by using fabs to increase the size of the subunit to allow visualization by uh, zinc particle naked stain electromicroscopy. And it's also clearly important that one knows the subunit stoichiometry of all the subunits to determine um, the relative position of subunits within the EM density map. And then um, models can be generated both by uh, crystallography, uh, NMR, and also by uh, homologs from homologous structures. And then we can then refine the structures um, in the uh, density map using Euro, which is really body refinement procedure. And then, of course, eventually we'd like to um, determine or is it, um, structures ab initio by lecture mycoscopy. And this has been possible so far, actually, for very high symmetry assemblies, such as viruses. So this work published two years ago by Hong Su showed that a, um, a non-enveloped uh, virus could be um, determined to 3.2 angstrom resolution. This was uh, allowed um, Hong Su's lab to actually to determine ab initio the, the structure of the uh, subunits of the proteins of the, of the virus. So in principle, if EM can be extended to high enough resolution, one can actually use it to determine ab initio structures. But that's not um, yet been possible for asymmetric structures. It's only been possible for high, sli high symmetry structures such as viruses. So I'll just finish here by um, acknowledging my, my colleagues who did this work. And so the, um, the crystallography was done by um, uh, Kieran Kukerny and um, Sigu Zhang. And the electron microscopy was done primarily by um, Paolo De Fonseca, um, Anne Schreiber, and also Ed Morris. And Sigu Zhang actually generated um, many of the recombinant APC complexes. So I'll finish there. Thank you. Nick Deep Birkbeck, did the scaling of the map you presumably got out of your molecular replacement help you then to get the scales right for fitting your big complex? Because one of the issues with the uh, maps is getting the absolute scale. Uh, we didn't use that information actually, so the scale was already pretty accurate actually, so um, that's a good question, but we didn't rescale the EM density maps relative um, to the, uh, well, to, 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 to improve the uh, molecular replacement. Um, structure, termination, yeah. Uh, Tom, to a while ago. I'm wondering, is there, you used rigid body to place these um, uh, uh, yes, molecules. Yes, yes. I yeah. wonder, 
do you see any additional <laughs> distortion of the molecules, particularly the longer ones, yes. um, that you might uh, need some mechanism in order to uh, place that a uh, little bit more accurately? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, so, so that's a good point. So um, for the spectrum of the TPR subunits, the, we can treat the dimerization domain where the two um, subunits dimerize. That forms a pretty rigid structure. That's a rigid body. But then the, the C-term or TPR TP helices tend to flex relative to the um, N-terminal dimerization domain. So we treated those as different rigid bodies. So we, we, did, we did create rigid bodies, but we didn't create too many because that would become probably complicated. But, and also the um, APC2, the, the culling domain, culling repeats the n term is was treated as a separate rigid body relative to the C-terminal globular domain. So we did attempt that, yes. Yeah. Randy. Yeah, Randy Reed, Cambridge. Uh, David, that was <coughs> very nice, but you didn't mention what would have seemed like the most obvious approach that probably didn't work. Uh, which is just to do a six-dimensional search for the models within the whole density. Now, does that not find something, or is there ambiguity about which of the homologs <coughs> you found? Um, well, we, no, we didn't try it because um, I, I think it's, it, well, yes. The, we, we, we actually thought that the, the empirical approach actually to, to obtain, you know, objective information about the position of subunits in the EM map is actually better than trying to use... Um, a method for six-dimensional search approach. And um, if, I mean, uh, I think also, it depends on resolution, but at certain resolutions, you don't often get definitive matches between the atomic model and the EM density, especially when you have homologs. So the TPR subunits are all highly related in structure, and therefore we couldn't necessarily distinguish between CDC 16 and 27 and 23. So I think the empirical approach of deleting subunits um, is more reliable method for <laughs> defining their position. But um, uh, yeah, no, we, we haven't done that yet. Uh, William Booth, uh, University of South Carolina. I wanted to ask, um, you, you said something about uh, size limitations as it relates to electron my, uh, microscopy? Yes. What is the, uh, I guess, what is the preferred size for uh, well, it, it's, a, it's a bit variable, but for negative stain electron microscopy, the sort of general feeling is that anything smaller than 100,000 Dalton is too small to visualize by, by negative stain electron microscopy. Uh, whereas for cryo electron microscopy, where you have much lower contrast compared to negative stain electron microscopy, you have to have a larger size even than that. So the, the minimum there is about 0.5 megadalton approximately to be able to see uh, uh, enough features on the electron micrographs to visualize particles. It's, those are the rough ballpark figures. I mean, is that because of the sort of particle identification? Because once you've identified them, it presumably wouldn't matter so much. Uh, yeah, so I think, if you, yes, for ab initio determination, probably that you, you need to have a larger size. I mean, probably once you have some reference information, you could use that information mm -hmm. to search on your micrograss for particles, yeah. yeah. <coughs> One more question up here. So is it possible to say anything about uh, the orientation of these uh, symmetric su subunits like this, for example, this w WD40 uh, domain that uh, seems to be a symmetric? Yes, that's the, yes. Um, we do know about that due to the, um, the fact that we know how the W40 domain is the co-activated subunits bind to the, the destruction motif, the D-box motif, and then we know where on the structure um, the D-box binds to the W40 beta propeller. And therefore, and also we can now determine in the EM maps where the D-box is located. So that does actually provide some constraints to the orientation of the W40 beta propeller in the maps. Yeah. Okay. okay, so I think we should thank David again for his excellent lecture and for sticking so brilliantly to time. <laughs> Let this be a lesson to all this morning's speakers. So now we move on to Tom Terwilliger. Tom is going to tell us about <coughs> conservation in local structure, I believe. My end is on. Now, there we go. Thank you very much, Keith. And thanks 
to the organizers for inviting me to this fascinating meeting. I've been enjoying it, learning a lot. And I'd also like to thank, more generally, uh, CCP4 for its uh, wonderful relationship uh, with the Phoenix group that I'm a, a member of. Uh, CCP4 has contributed a great deal of software and, and coding uh, to Phoenix that, and done special work to help us, uh, help us out. Uh, CCP4 has invited us uh, to participate in workshops, for example, at the Argonne Workshop regularly Phoenix people have come to the CC4 uh, workshop there. And so I'm very thankful uh, for that and for such a wonderful relationship between uh, our, our teams. So today I want to talk about making use of some information that's always been there, and it's very simple, in fact, uh, for uh, relating molecular replacement templates with the models that we're trying to create. And you'll see, actually, the things I'm going to talk about are very closely related to the ones that David Barford uh, just uh, related, uh, related to us, but on a different size scale. And it's kind of a, more of a metaphor than an exact parallel. The work I'm going to talk about is a collaboration with uh, Randy Reed, Axel Bringer, uh, Paul Adams, and, and, and myself. So uh, first, to reiterate the, the challenge that uh, Frank DeMaio mentioned uh, yesterday in molecular placement, there's kind of two, two big problems in molecular placement. One is finding where your molecule goes, and the second one is once you've found where the molecule goes, uh, having a template at that point that's accurate enough to generate phases that are good enough to iterate through m m iterative model building and density modification and so forth to improve uh, those, those models. So it, a big problem in many cases is that, in fact, uh, a correctly placed template is not close enough to the final model. So there are many ways to deal with that problem, and I'll talk about one, uh, one of them uh, now. And this, this solution is going to be uh, a distortion of the template to make it more like the final model. And let me justify that idea a little bit. So here's a picture of uh, two structures. Uh, one is the, the structure of a uh, uh, of XRMRV, prote it's a, uh, a protease, uh, which has a, a, an identity of about 30% uh, to the template that was used to solve this structure. And if you look at these two structures, if you just ask, oh, say, what's the overall RMSD between these two models, it's fairly large. So on a gross scale, these are relatively different molecules. And in fact, the template is not a very good start for rebuilding this model. It was one of the, this is one of the structures that Frank described that the authors were unable to solve this structure because the template was too different. One solution for that was to use a, a molecular placement and Rosetta after that, and I'll show you another solution for that here. But if you look at these two models a little bit more closely and look locally, you'll see that locally they're actually quite similar to each other. So look at right here at this small region, for example. These two segments of model are almost identical. They're simply shifted. And similarly, this, this segment of model is, is very similar. And if you just shift it a little bit, they'd be almost identical. Over here, again, the same thing. Not everywhere, but in many cases. So even though these are, all th those, these are optimally superimposed, locally, they're much, much closer than they are globally. So we want to take advantage of that, that similarity. And there are many ways to take advantage of sim local similarities of structures, and these have been uh, applied in the past. You can do rigid body refinement of segments, for example. Um, you, can use, you can search for fragments with FFE or Essence, another way to do that. Den refinement uh, from Axel Bringer's laboratory also, and, and jelly body refinement both uh, can take advantage of the fact that there's more similarity locally uh, than globally. The Rosetta modeling that Frank DeMaio talked about yesterday um, and morphing would be another uh, approach for doing this. So, so here's the idea for morphing. We, we've placed our model in the crystallographic unit cell. We've calculated an electron density map based on that model. And that electron density map may not be very good, but it has at least something to do with the correct answer, and presumably it has some information that wasn't in the model to start with. So that's our starting situation. So what are we going to do? Um, we're going to take advantage of this fact that the local part of the, locally the structure may be more fit similar. We're going to try to distort this model to distort it into our electron density map. 
And one important feature here is that if you tried to do this atom by atom, it would be very difficult because the map is going to be terrible and you have no idea where to move one particular atom. But if you have a large group of atoms, so maybe a 10 angstrom sphere or 6 angstrom sphere, you might be able to figure out where that whole group of atoms goes much more accurately. So if the size of that is on the same scale as the distortion, then everything will work out well. So we're going to assume that this relationship is just a simple distortion. So here's um, a challenging morphing problem. Um, this is one, another one of the structures that Frank DeMaio uh, mentioned uh, yesterday that were sent in as a structure that couldn't be solved by anybody. Um, and then it was, this was solved by um, molecular replacement plus Rosetta. And now I'll show you that you can also do this um, with, with morphing. So what we're looking at here uh, in green is our uh, final model. This is what we want to get in the end. And the, and the molecular replacement template is in blue, which is, has 32% identity. And this particular uh, map that I'm showing you here is the 2FO minus FC uh, map uh, based on the blue model. And as you can see, uh, this map is not very good. And it would be hard to tell from this map what to do uh, to get the, next, the correct structure. If you do standard refinement on this structure, um, it does move it a little bit in the correct direction. I'll mention in, in passing that in this particular case, if you do extensive, extensive refinement, you actually can solve this structure. 100 cycles of Phoenix refinement, it will move it uh, in the right direction. But normal amount of refinement, you can't do that. So here's our map. Um, and we're going to do the, the following things to, to morph our, our structure. So we're going to try to identify for each C alpha in the, uh, in, in the structure, we're going to try to identify where do I move this C alpha. So we're going to draw a little vector from our C alpha to where it's supposed to go. And then we'll go to the next one and draw a little arrow to say where this one's going to supposed to go. And we're going to smooth all these to make a distortion field, you might call it in mathematics. But basically it's a way to map the model onto a different uh, uh, arrangement in, into our density. And so we're going to get a local translation, we're going to smooth it, and we're going to apply, apply the smooth translation to all the atoms in a residue. So the residue is going to move in the end as a complete unit undistorted. The next residue is going to move a little bit differently, and there might, the junction between them might not be that great, and we're going to fix that with, with refinement. So how do we identify uh, that translation? So this is what we want to get here. We're going to identify one C alpha atom and figure out where that one is going to go using this map. So first we're going to draw a circle around that, a sphere around that C alpha atom. We'll draw the calculated density in pink. And then we'll ask, how do we shift that calculated density so it maximally overlaps on the blue density? And that's the shift that will do the maximum overlap onto the blue density. And it's, as you can see, it's a shift in the right direction for this particular C alpha. So we just looked at that one C alpha, what's around it, and it's asked where to move. And actually, in this particular case, we got the right answer. Um, and we can apply that to all the C alpha atoms, smooth them, and apply that shift, and here's what we get. So we move the whole thing very much in the correct uh, direction where we want it to go. Then we refine that, moves it a little bit closer to where we want to go, can iterate that process a few times, and by now, our electron density map that we're calculating from the model looks a lot more like the right answer. This is now a suitable state for going ahead and doing iterative model building refinement in the usual way without any difficulties um, and generating a final structure from this one. So for this kind of a case, very straightforward, doesn't take very long, it's very easy uh, to do. So, now let's look at a couple more details about what we've done here. The, the morphed model here is in green. Uh, uh, morphed model is, is yellow, sorry. And the auto-milled final, final model here is in green. So if we look at this region that I focused on uh, originally, you can see that the morphed model is moved right exactly on top of the correct structure. So that everything is basically perfect right there. Over on the, lef uh, on the left side here, it's not quite... So whoops, come back is not quite that way because there's actually an insertion here that is, wasn't present in the starting template. So there's no way you could distort this uh, starting model into the final one because there's an, a, an additional uh, residue that's present there. So this won't, obviously won't work completely perfectly in cases like that. Also notice that everything moves uh, as a unit. 
uh, each side chain basically moves as, as a complete unit. It doesn't change its um, orientation or shape. So this is what we've done. We've gone from the blue here uh, to the yellow, which is very similar to the final uh, structure. Uh, we might ask, in this process, uh, it's critical to have a, a good electron density map to do the morphing process into. And so what's the best electron density map to do that with? Uh, so I took the various structures that Frank uh, described uh, yesterday and did this process on all of them and, and calculated different electron density maps um, to, to carry out the process. So this, this uh, slide shows on the y-axis is the correlation of a map calculated at any particular point to the final refined map. So basically this is how good the maps are on the, on the y-axis. The x-axis is various structures. And the different colors are different stages. The blue is the original template, so we calculate a map from the template originally um, and ask how correlated that is with the final one. You can see these are pretty low on the range of 0.2, except for one here that's really high. So very low. After simple refinement, um, they get a little bit better, but not that, not that much. The maps that you calculate, uh, the standard one you might do would be a 2 m, uh, sigma A weighted 2 mL f mO. 2 MFO minus DFC map. Um, that's this one here. It's pretty good. Uh, you can do a little bit better by density modification with the triangles. An omit map in blue is often a little bit better. The very best one is the prime and switch uh, density modified map. This is essentially a map in which you've carried out density modification but without using the model information after the very first step. Kind of erases the, the memory of the original model, has a lower bias uh, than a traditional density modified uh, map. So that one turns out to be the best, takes a little bit longer, but it's not too much of a problem. Uh, so we can uh, ask how well this, this process works by taking a structure, uh, a particular target structure, and I have a whole bunch of homology models uh, that are of uh, varying relationships to that. We can just see how well they all uh, work. So uh, the x-axis here is just sorted by structure. The y-axis is the final map correlation, so how good uh, the process um, has been overall. And the, the little black uh, uh, diamonds, where I, which is I've sorted this on, are the templates. So this is how good each template is. If you take the template, calculate a map just from the template, how similar that map is uh, to the final uh, map. And so that goes from uh, 0.1 up to about 0.65 or so. And then the uh, or, or red uh, squares are after, ref oops, after refinement, and the uh, blue triangles are after, after morphing for all these. And so morphing works uh, better than refinement. This is extensive refinement. The, in the case that I told you about, for example, uh, it was able to actually solve it in that one particular case. So this is using that as a very challenging uh, comparison, so 100 cycles of, of refinement versus uh, morphing. Uh, so morphing beats it almost, almost every time. Uh, and both are considerably better um, than, than the template in all these cases. So works nicely, doesn't take very long to do. It takes about, uh, well, not so different in time from, from 100 cycles of refinement, in fact, so you can get an idea about how long uh, it takes to do this. And we can also compare morphing with doing uh, MR Rosetta that uh, Frank uh, DeMaio mentioned yesterday. And of course, so MR Rosetta takes much longer, it takes about 10 times as long as doing morphing, and morphing takes about 10 times as long as just doing auto building, uh, as doing a uh, simple refinement and map, sorry. Uh, so here's the comparison of that. Here's several structures um, which were challenging um, uh, for, for structure solution. I should mention that uh, over the past couple of years, all the methods have gotten lots, uh, much, much better. So during the process of solving those structures uh, that Frank described uh, yesterday, when we initially got those structures, they could, none of them could be solved by a simple by auto building, just for example. Uh, but today, auto building refinement are so much better that a lot of those structures could be solved now by that approach. So I set most of those aside, uh, but not all of them here. Okay, so here's a description uh, comparing uh, morphing with auto building. Uh, this, these are structures uh, sorted on resolution, free R values. So low is good here. Um, uh, simple auto building in. in in uh, uh, orange here, and uh, so some of these can be solved pretty well, some of them can't be solved at all by uh, auto building. Uh, with morphing, uh, they're generally uh, quite a bit better, and MR Rosetta is still the best. So MR Rosetta will get the best structures for all, for all of these uh, structures. And as I said, those go kind of in order of uh, auto building, morphing, MR Rosetta, and the amount of time required. So what you would do, um, just try Simple refinement first. If you solve your structure that way, great. If it doesn't work, try morphing. If it doesn't work, try MR Rosetta. 
Okay. So last a few minutes, I want to talk about another problem that is also is related to this one, and, and the solution is, is going to again going to be making use of information that's already there um, in in our, in our template uh, structure, and. Uh, so the case here I'm going to talk about is we have relatively low resolution map. Maybe it's not all that great. Um, and we've got our homology model. Um, we've morphed it or into our struct, into our, our density as, as good as it's going to be. And how do we decide um, which parts of this template to use um, to do our further model building? And how do we assign the sequence to that model optimally? And we're going to make use of the connectivity of the template. So we're going to make the assumption that our template it was a homology model after all, that the, the connectivity in our template is going to be the same as the connectivity in our final structure, even if there's a little bit of distortions, maybe there's some loops inserted and something like that. But we're not going to have the beginning of this one be connected with the end of that one. So that's the assumption in this uh, next process. Um, so how do we uh, look at this? Let's, let's take a, a, another one of these challenging cases. This is another one of the cases from Frank's studies. This study was, this structure was actually solved um, by Axel Brunger using uh, den refinement and, and auto building. Um, so even after MR was data, this particular structure, it was solved in the sense that the free R was under 42% or 40%. It was clearly right. The maps were somewhat okay. Um, but in fact, um, it was not uh, able to, uh, the JCSG group who were working on this weren't able to get a great structure out of it. They got a much better, actually got a much better structure using den refinement plus auto building. So we can use this one as a challenging case. And so the first step here is we're going we're to start from the template placed in the correct place. Um, then we're going to morph the model uh, to uh, optimally fit the map. And what we're basically trying to get is going from this template pink here to, towards that final uh, structure. And the morph model is in blue here. And so you can see that the morph model, the, the chain just doesn't change in shape overall very much. It just moves up, and it moves more into uh, the density. So we're going to morph model by, to find the local distortions. Um, we're going to create a new map with uh, auto building then, uh, uh, starting from that morph model. So we're going to try to get the very best map we can at this stage before we try to assign our sequence to it. OK. Um, and then, so then once we've got that map, um, we want to decide which residues to get rid of here. So we're going to basically just trim this model down to match the map that we've got. And in Phoenix, there's a simple command to do this trimming process. So we want to take this model and trim it down. And so here's our uh, trimmed model. And basically, we've, we've trimmed all the residues that have a low correlation to the density of the map that we've calculated. And the remaining residues that you can see here are very close to the, the final model. So the, the ones that remain are, are very good. Here's a, just a quick local view of, of doing that. We basically just trimmed off things like that. So we've made it. All right. So now we've got our, our trimmed model. And the problem is, and this trimmed model is very close to the, to the final model. So, so pink here, or the purple one, is the, the final structure from Axel. And you can see that the yellow model matches it very, very closely in the parts that we've kept. So basically, we've gotten rid of all the bad stuff. Um, and it matches very well. So now think back for a second. All we did here um, was we started from this template, um, and we uh, did a quick auto building to get a better map. And then we've trimmed the, the and we've morphed the model to distort it into the map, auto build to get a better map. And we've just trimmed off all the bad things. And now it's almost exactly right. So that's just really amazing. So this template, even though it was way too far to do molecular placement and solve the structure easily, is actually very close after distortion and trimming of the right thing. So it's really got a very good situation here. Now the problem, though, um, is uh, the sequence is not aligned. We don't know what residues go with what part of the sequence. Um, and the connectivity is no longer obvious. So once we um, have cut off all these pieces, now we've got all these fragments here. And it's not, if you just look at it that way, you don't know what's connected to what. But we're going to make use of what information we have. So how, about, how do we go about doing the assignment of s segments of structure to, to sequence? Um, and the usual way to do that is you have a model, uh, a, a main chain model at some, at some point. And at each uh, point along that chain, you can ask, what does the side chain density look like? And you can make a little table that says how similar the side chain density at each point is to each of the different possible amino acids. So we can go to position one, looks mostly like isoleucine. Position two looks mostly like valine, and so forth. And then from this little table, um, we can figure out uh, the probability of, sequence al of different possibilities for sequence alignment. Now, that's fine. Uh, but it only works well if you have a relatively long sequence. 
or a relatively good map. So this map I was just showing you, if you have a very long fragment, say 47 residues, you can get a very clear identification of where a particular fragment goes. You're going to align this all possible places and say how well the density matches uh, that particular sequence of side chains. And in this case, there's, there's only one way it could go. So LLG of 60 for a particular location it wouldn't ever happen by chance. We know that one exactly. If you have a shorter thing, 19 residues, we're getting down to 40. 15 residues, we're getting down to about 20 or so. So once you're under 10, particularly if the map is not good, it gets more challenging. So there's lower and lower uh, confidence as you get to uh, shorter and shorter sequences. So in this particular case, if you only use this information, um, then you can assign uh, maybe a third or a quarter of the residues uh, to sequence, and the other ones you don't know what they are. But we can use additional information. For example, you can't use the same uh, piece of chain twice, um, and you can get quite a bit more assigned to sequence. You can also score for uh, the end of this chain being close to the beginning of that chain, and so those are probably similar and uh, close together in sequence, that sort of thing. We can get a lot more that way. Um, and then finally, since we started from our homology model, we know the order of the segments. And this is an incredibly powerful piece of information. And here, it's, here uh, let me show you why this is obviously true. So suppose we have this one segment. We want to figure out where it goes in the sequence. So if we don't know anything about um, the remainder of the molecule, it could go anywhere. Uh, and However, if we already know that there's other pieces of seg uh, other segments of structure that are present, and we know that this one comes before ours and that one comes after ours, it limits the place where it can go dramatically. So we've made many fewer choices, therefore we can get a much more confident assessment of where it goes. So if we do just that extra piece of information, we've got a lot more sequence information done here. Um, if we, can, we can then iterate this whole process so we can identify our best assignments of sequence. Um, and make a whole list of possible combinations. And then we can try to connect the adjacent ends, for example, and we can score all these based on side chain mass to density and connections. And then we can connect up the good ones to make a new starting model that has bigger pieces than we started with. Then we can assign those more accurately, iterate that process a little bit. Um, and then we can, in this particular case, um, assign all the residues in, uh, correctly. So then we can ask, well, is this, uh, uh, oh, so then in this particular case, we can get a correct assignment of everything um, and pretty good uh, rebuilding of this model. Uh, we can then ask, well, that particular case worked great. Um, what about in general? How much improvement do we expect to get by using this connectivity uh, method? And so this graph you know, you can see it, uh, shows you that these are the same templates of a series of templates series of homology uh, of homologs of the structure 1A2B that have sequence identity from 7 to 30 percent. And I've sorted them um, by uh, the y-axis here is the fraction of residues with the correct uh, sequence out of the, all, the whole structure. Um, and I've sorted them based on not using connectivity in the, on the, in the triangles. And then, you, so you can see uh, for these various templates, we've done the whole morphing process, we've done the whole trimming process, the whole a uh, sequence assignment process for all of each one of these. And you can see that using the connectivity really dramatically improves the fraction of residues that are correctly assigned uh, to sequence in pretty much every case. And uh, so that's the, I'd like to thank uh, many people for, for data, the people that supplied this to Frank early on. It was really very helpful to have that. Um, and there's uh, scripts and documentation of the whole process um, in, on the Phoenix uh, website. This is a part of the. This is done by the uh, Phoenix Project, and I'd like to thank everybody there, including Paul Adams, um, Randy, and Jane Dave Richardson, the PIs um, on the uh, Phoenix Project. Lastly, I want to just make a quick plug uh, for uh, another meeting. Uh, those of you who are uh, who've been to other structural genomics meetings over the years, um, you know that we've had these once every uh, several years. There'll be a really this is a big meeting that's going to be in Sapporo, Japan, next next summer. There will be a lot of methods. There will be workshops before the meeting um, that will be crystallographic and NMR and cell-free systems and so forth uh, before the meeting as well. And there will be many methods um, talked about um, at the meeting. I invite you all to, to come to that meeting. Um, and i uh, be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much.
language. So I'm just wondering when you are doing this, this morphing and determining the translation vector, do you also consider the, the rotation as well, that there might be a very slight change, or just to create it as a pure translation? Yeah, good boy. Very, very good question. So one would expect that, in fact, there would be rotations. Uh, the, I get around that um, by doing iterative translations, right? So a rotation can be thought of um, as a series of translations. If, if, if two parts of our molecule are serially translated, in the first one, you can move this one up a little bit and that one a little bit less, and effectively you've rotated the molecule slightly. So in effect, you can rotate uh, the entire molecule that way. It's not as efficient as doing, uh, it's not as precise as doing a rotation, but you get much of the same result. Doing a rotation would take a lot more calculation to do, so we aren't actually doing it that way and just doing the serial uh, translations instead. If, so, if there were substantial rotations, it might be more efficient um, to find the rotations in the beginning. Basically, the way you would have to do that is to, have, to take your large, uh, your large um, region of density that you're, you're considering to, well, we tr consider for translations, and you'd consider rotations of that uh, before doing those translations. Um, so then you'd have to do many more uh, uh, FFTs to do the, the calculation in the beginning. But it's a good question. Good Benjamin. My, my, I'm sorry, Ben Bax, GlaxoSmithKline. My question was kind of related to that. Sometimes you see a helix that looks like it's rotated, um, you know, in a low-resolution structure when you're doing these molecular replacements. And it yeah. seems like you wouldn't really get a helix rotation very well with your morphing method. It's yeah, translation. You, would, you would get a... Well, it depends on what, how low the resolution is, whether this would work very well. So basically, uh, by translation of the helix along the axis, you effectively get the rotation, except you get the, the, the uh, except, of course, the, um, the, the uh, location of all your C alphas is a little bit different. So in part you get that, but no, that is, that's a valid point, yes. Tom, in cases when the map's really ropey, would a Patterson correlation function help with mor morphing, especially if there are lots of correlated movements? So, when the maps are, are very bad, um, Ben's asking if, he, if, if the Patterson correlation function could be used. And so, actually, we, we tried some things along those lines. You can take a, a small box, and instead of using the density as it is, you can do a, make a Patterson function, and you can use that. Basically, that allows you to do the uh, rotation part very fast, and you don't have to worry about the translation part. So that, that is a possibility uh, for doing it that way. Um, the thing is, though, that, in fact, the Patterson function uh, is actually more noisy than the starting, um, the real, than the real space map that you were working with. So in fact, um, it's, and you're kind of throwing away some of the information for the overlaps. So in effect, particularly if the maps are not good, it's probably, I think it's probably better to stick with the real space map um, and not lose any information um, in that process. And maybe take longer to do the rotations, but uh, to not use the, the Patterson, yeah. Any more questions? Randy. Yeah, I'll just go quickly. Um, since this is since morphing is so much faster than MR Rosetta, are you going to put morphing into NMR Rosetta because it wouldn't actually change the runtime very much, but the combination might be more powerful? Uh, yeah, it's a good point. Uh, so, it's I haven't done that. Uh, you morphing is in auto building. You can do that uh, by default if you wish. But but to do it before uh, MR Rosetta, no, we haven't done that. It's a good idea. We could try that. Yes. Tim Grün from Göttingen. In the first example you showed, there was a proline on the right-hand side of the screen, and the yeah. density looked as though the backbone was connected to the part that you morphed. So how do you know that your final model is not suffering from model bias, and that you got a wrong backbone traced after the morphing? So model bias in the morphing process is, is a big concern, right? And so that's why, so definitely, I, that's why I spent so much time to try to get the least biased uh, map uh, uh, possible. Um, but there will always remain bias in, in those maps, and so it's hard to know for sure that you're not going to have some kind of problem like that. So basically the answer to your question, though, is once the model is morphed um, and then you rebuild the whole thing, um, basically all that model bias is, is going away, it, particularly at relatively high resolution where many of these have been done. So these are all 3.2 angstroms um, or better. If you did this process at very low resolution, it could be a, a much more serious problem. You wouldn't know um, whether there was... Uh, this model bias. You could get around it by doing omit maps. So basically you could even do an omit map bef 
and one of the maps types I showed was a composite omit map. So effectively, you're not going to have much model bias there, but the maps aren't as good. They're even worse, so that you, you're, you're balancing off bias versus quality of map. Two last questions. Frank, then Martin. Um, so you use the, uh, the bit that you try and move, do you use only the backbone or the entire 3D environment? Because yeah. that might be preserved as well, right? It's a very good question. So actually, uh, that's your option. That's a, that's a flag that you can set whichever way you like. The default, I did it in this ca these cases with all the atoms, including the, the side chain atoms. Yeah. I meant the whole sphere around the CLF and not just along the backbone. Yes, it's the whole sphere. All right. It's the whole sphere and it's all atoms in the sphere or just backbone atoms from something that's in that sphere, either your choice. When you, when you tried systematically using lots of different templates as the starting point for morphing, did you find a trend in what was successful other than sequence identity to the original one, like resolution of the template or anything like that? Yeah, I didn't do it. That's a very good, very good question. I didn't do a systematic study of that. I'll tell you, though, um, I didn't plot them in order of sequence identity because it, that was not the order that they would show up here. So the sequence identity did not map directly. You know, generally it does, of course, but not directly into quality of the starting model, no. Okay. Uh, before we break for coffee, I'd just like to remind all speakers they should stay behind after this session for a photograph. That is now. And then I'd like again to thank the two speakers from this morning for such excellent, well-timed talks.